This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. My guest today is Jay Bhattacharya, a co-author of the Great Barrington Declaration and one of the plaintiffs in Murthy v. Missouri. That's the Supreme Court case charging that the Biden administration and other parts of the federal government illegally colluded with social media companies to suppress disfavored speakers' viewpoints and content. A decision in that case is imminent, and a victory for Bhattacharya's side would make it impossible for the government to pressure Twitter, Facebook, and other platforms to ban or squelch legal speech. A professor of medicine at Stanford and a PhD economist, Bhattacharya talks with me about his experience being blacklisted online because of his criticisms of lockdowns and other COVID policies, the ways in which Donald Trump and Joe Biden both fumbled responses to the pandemic, and what the public health establishment must do to regain the trust and confidence of the American public. Here is The Reason Interview with Jay Bhattacharya. Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, thanks for talking to Reason. Thanks for having me, Nick. Nice to be back. Uh, you are uh, a plaintiff in a case in front of the Supreme Court that will be decided sometime in the in the near future. We're taping this in uh, mid-May. Uh, Murthy v. Missouri. What is the crux of the case? So the the crux is that uh, the Biden administration essentially set up its its. Uh, government so that it would go to social media companies, tell the social media companies, you must censor these people and these ideas, where they would list out the ideas, you know, ideas like uh, the evidence on masking is, is not so good, mm -hmm. uh, that, that there is immunity after COVID recovery, that, that the vaccines don't, uh, don't stop you from getting and spreading COVID, right? So stuff that's within the realm of science. Right. Uh, uh, there were other stuff too, more yeah. political stuff. Uh, but they would go to the social media companies and say, you need to censor people that say these things on social media posts. You need to develop algorithms that automatically identify posts that, that have those ideas in them. You need to suppress the reach of them and you need to suppress a list of people. You must, uh, so that- And you were on one of those lists or many of those uh, lists. And we're talking primarily, uh, not exclusive, but primarily about Facebook and uh, Twitter. Yeah, so uh, the discovery in the case found there were people like Alex Berenson, uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. that were explicitly named. Uh, I, I wasn't explicitly named in the discovery in the case, but in the Twitter files, which is the the, the, the backdoor files that are available, that Twitter has for administrative purposes. Right. And that came to light when Elon Musk took over and was cleaning out the basement and was like, oh, here to a bunch of journalists. Take right. A look at all this. So Christmas 2022, I got a... a, a Barry Weiss, mm -hmm. who's a journalist right. who established the Free Press, she called me and said, Jay, I found your name in this Twitter database, and it says you are on a blacklist. Mm -hmm. And then I, Elon invited me to go visit him at Twitter headquarters, which is a surreal experience. Uh, and I saw my name with the word blacklist on it. Uh, and it turns out that, the, that I had been placed on this blacklist the day I joined Twitter in 2021. Uh, the first thing I did was I tweeted a link to the Great Barrington Declaration, which is a document I wrote arguing for focus protection of vulnerable older people and lifting lockdowns. What did it feel like when you are reading, you know, something and then you you are on a blacklist in the United States of America? You're an adoptive country. You became a citizen here at age 19. You moved here originally from India, escaping political, you know, upheaval and lack of free speech rights. What's it feel like? It was surreal, Nick. Uh, I grew up, as you said, in the United States, and uh, I mean, I went to school in the United States from when I was four. Uh, the American civic religion is free speech. Blacklists are a thing of the past, right? They happened in the '50s or something. You know, it's not. And it's, it's always a stain on the on the country, right? Right, and yeah. so look, of course, that could never happen in modern America. And then to see my name on a blacklist is just was just I I, I didn't know how to process it. Now, you, um, I mean, the, the argument of the case, and it was originally brought by the Attorney General of Missouri and uh, also Louisiana, and then there's a, a bunch of other plaintiffs, including yourself and the two, uh, one of the signers of the Great Barrington Declaration. Um, you know, the government says we were not insisting on this. Um, is that just, in your mind, that's just BS? Or 
I mean, talk a little bit about the collusion between the social media platforms and the government, because one of the things both in the Twitter files and reasons Robbie Suave reported on what we call the Facebook files, which was a similar cache of documents where there were many, many people at these platforms going to the government and saying, we're not sure about this. What should we do? Does that count as censorship or blacklist as well? I mean, there's, there's a line, but the government crossed the line, mm-hmm. right? So you, you had uh, the, the White House, the Surgeon General's office, the CDC, uh, a, a, you know, sort of a government agency after government agency. Uh, and in the discovery of the case, what you find is it's a, it's, it's a range of things. There's things like that, which is like, you know, we, we're not sure. Yeah. Uh, but uh, ranging to, you know, kick these people off or else. We're, and sometimes the, the what else is, is implied. Is there a specific instance of that? Like, you better shut down Jay Bhattacharya or else we're going to shoot at your porch lights or what? <laughs> uh, so not, nothing exactly that said Jay Bhattacharya, but like, you know, you need to censor these, the, these kinds of ideas that, that cover the kinds of ideas I was expressing. Um, but to sometimes directly people, right? Here's a list of people, RFK Jr. Uh, yeah. The or else was very often... Uh, Section 230. Section 230 is is a, 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 a part of the Communications Decency Act, right. and it enables social media companies to exist. Right. right? They, 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 it's the Internet's First Amendment, the 26 words that created the Internet, things like that. And, you know, reason everybody online has been a beneficiary of it. Exactly, right? So, like, you can publish something. I can, I can publish something on Twitter, right. and then Twitter can't get sued if I lie about somebody right. else. Yeah. Um, that's what Section 230 provides. And so the, 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 the implication would be, if you don't cooperate with us, we're going to go after you using legislative and regulatory mechanisms to take away some of those protections. Mm-hmm. In uh, the the House did its own investigation of the Facebook uh, files, mm-hmm. and what they found was that uh, Facebook uh, will have these internal discussions where they say, "Well, if we don't cooperate, we're not going to be able to get some of these legislative priorities that we really need to survive as a company." Mm-hmm. Right. So, for instance, yeah, the EU has these privacy laws that essentially would put Facebook out of existence in the EU. And the, the threat was the Biden administration won't represent American companies in, in trade negotiations with the EU if they don't comply with the censorship orders. And then to complicate it more, Facebook and at least the pre-Elon Musk Twitter also participated in this. But uh, Facebook was running ads saying, you know what, we, uh, we've we been around for a while, and the Section 230 is old, it needs to be changed. I mean, they were ready to play ball with regulation as long as it seemed to protect their market share and things like that. Yeah. I mean, it, it, if you read the discovery in the Missouri versus Biden case and some of the, the, the other evidence that have come out, it, the, the response from the social media companies reads like a, like a hostage situation. Like right? they're, they're trying their best to try to negotiate with people that, are, that, that have held themselves while help being held hostage, um, while being held hostage to the, the power that the government has over them. It's, and so and they, you, you'll see things like, well, we don't really think this violates our terms of service, but we're going to do it anyways mm-hmm. because if we don't, we don't, we don't know and what that's, happened. that's the real nub, right? If this is protected speech, you know, and, and Facebook and Twitter are private companies. They have a right to do pretty much whatever they want as long as they're not obviously contravening their terms of service. But there's something wrong if you're saying, we don't like this particular opinion, so we want to squelch it. Right. No, I think that that is a direct violation of the First Amendment. What um, you know? What what is the what's the best outcome? Well, you you went to the Supreme Court to the oral arguments about this. Um, what did you find there? And and does that make you think? You know, prognosticate? Are is are you going to win this case, or is the government going to win? So uh, the lower courts found on our favor. Uh, over and over and over again. So uh, the case is actually still under consideration in uh, Louisiana. Uh, it, it, the, uh, what, what we got in Louisiana was a preliminary injunction against the Biden administration that told the Biden administration that it was not allowed to censor, to go and pressure well, social really media companies. Well, really to talk to, uh, to kind of jawbone or even really interact with social media. Yeah, and, and, and the idea was like that you can't jawbone for the purpose of restricting legal speech, right? Uh, there was another aspect of the lower court decision, which is very interesting, which is that, uh, and it has to do with the mechanisms by which the government enacts this censorship regime. Uh, they, they contract essentially 
or give grants to third-party organizations, organizations like the Stanford Internet Observatory, to create algorithms to censor at scale, to, to suggest terms of service changes for the organizations. They use these, these organizations to launder the censorship requests. And so the, the lower court said, look, you're not allowed to go jawbone or, or, or sort of pressure, the, coerce these social media companies directly, if you're the government, to, to restrict legal speech. And you're also not allowed to use third parties to do the same thing. The, the, the appeals court said that third party thing went too far for the, this is for a preliminary injunction. This is before the case has already full, been fully heard. Um, but that the, that the direct restriction on, on coercion, that, that still stands. And so that's what the Supreme Court is currently hearing. At the Supreme Court, I went to the oral arguments. If you read the, the lower court decisions, they are very definitive. Like they use words like, this is an Orwellian ministry of truth. Uh, that the Biden administration is engaged in essentially something like Al Capone going to, uh, going to like Chicago businesses and saying, that's a nice business you got there. It'd be a shame if something were to happen to it, right? That, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, I mean, I've read the discovery in the case and it's just, to me, it's quite convincing. I thought when I went to the Supreme Court that there's no way we could possibly lose. That, you know, it's going to be 9-0. This is such a clear and blatant violation of the American First Amendment. The whole purpose is to suppress legal speech by the government through illicit means. It's not saying that the government can't counteract and say OJ is wrong. I mean, of course, anyone, the government's allowed to do that too. It's that they suppress the reach of my speech. They su entirely suppress the, without my even knowing it. Um, so I thought this is going to be clear cut. But when I went to the oral arguments, uh, I actually have to tell you, Nick, I came out of it quite depressed. Uh, I thought, well, I went from like, we're going to win, we're going to win 9-0 to like, we're probably going to lose 7-2 or something. Yeah. Uh, and I don't, I don't, I, Explain I, that. And you, you've written about this and, and talked about it. Uh, 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 Judge, uh, uh, Associate Justice Katani Brown. Uh, Jackson. Jackson used a particular, or she asked a, a kind of theoretical question that kind of set you back. What was that? Right. So the, the government lawyer, what they were arguing is that the government needs to have the ability to suppress dangerous speech online or people will get heart hurt. Right? Which sounds like a reasonable argument until you think it through for a minute. Because what, what, what actually what they used it for was to suppress speech that, that often uh, that speech had it been allowed would have, would have constrained the government from acting in ways that hurt people. Right? So for instance, school closures during the pandemic, which hurt so many kids, if we'd had a free speech environment then, maybe we wouldn't have had them for so mm -hmm. long. Um, so Kataji Brown Jackson, she, she, uh, the hypothetical she asked the law uh, our lawyer uh, was, imagine that there's a social media craze where kids are jumping out of windows, filming themselves jumping out of windows and daring other kids to jump out of higher and higher windows. Uh, shouldn't the government have the right to, to essentially tell the social media companies, don't put that online? Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, my, I mean, my reaction to that was like, I, I just want to jump out a window myself because it was it seemed like just such a a, a tendentious argument. Mm -hmm. um, so, so first of all, uh, the 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 companies themselves have an interest in in not promoting suicidal suicide packs, just like they have an interest in not promoting uh, speech that that of direct violent threats and so on. It, it hurts their you know, sort of bottom line. Like you don't need the government to tell them necessarily to do that. Um, second, you, you don't, um, the, the, the idea that the government, the, the, the whole analogy that, that, the, 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 that the, this hypothetical draws pr is based on the premise that the government automatically knows what's good and bad for people. Right. Like here you have an example that's such obviously bad for, for kids. Kids should not jump out of windows. Well, I mean, th what actually happened during the pandemic was that the government suppressed speech that would have criticized government policy that in effect told kids metaphorically to jump out of windows, right? They closed schools harming kids at scale. They recommended that kids, even kids as young as six months old, take a vaccine that they probably didn't need. You know, European countries didn't recommend it for kids that age. Um, Nor did most of them didn't shut down schools the way that the U.S. did. Exactly. And so the, the suppression of the counter speech to the government is, is what's at stake, not government saying 
to companies, you know, it's a bad idea for kids to jump out of windows. What's, what's a good outcome? I mean, let's say uh, not, not only that um, your side wins this case and that free speech, or, or it's not that free speech is, is restored, but that the government is told you can't jawbone or lean on, you know, organizations and platforms. Um, what about, you know, what about Twitter and Facebook and any other platform taking, you know, perhaps saying, you know what, we don't want any medical speech on this uh, platform. We don't want any political speech. This is also all happening at the, you know, at the intersection of fears of electoral misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, you know, very weird phrases and terms that are, uh, you know, definitions that are very elastic. But what's the best outcome? Of this. I mean, I think I think that that, that uh, what I really want is that the government to get out of the business of regulating speech online. I think the, the, that free speech online is a tremendous opportunity for a, a huge flowering of, of scientific discussion, of, of 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 connections that will be made that would never otherwise be made. Uh, and the government suppressing that is a really really bad idea. It's it's analogous, I think, to the Gutenberg press being invented in you know 1450 or something. And uh, the government trying to say, the governments or the churches trying to say, you can't print books. And we're gonna, we need to have the right to censor the books. Which they you know, took advantage of for about 500 years. Right? They tried I, to, I mean, in America until the 50s, real 1950s, you know, censorship of some sort was pretty widespread. Yeah, but at the same time, uh, it, the, the, over time, the, that, those kinds of policies became more and more sort of outside the realm. I mean, I, yeah. I, like it's just seen as like, the, I mean, in fact, the entire, in my view, the Enlightenment is the pushing back against the government and the church power to, right. to, to, set, to set, suppress the spread of ideas via the free press. Right, right. Um, uh, and, you know, even, they, even if you had to do it anonymously, right, both in England during the 17th century and America in its early, in its early Republican phases, I mean, I should be careful getting into a discussion with historians no, about these sort of no, things. Well, yes. no, I'm saying that this, I mean, the, the idea that free speech is important for politics, people kind of take for granted, but you're also extending that into medical discoveries and medical discussions. So talk a little bit about that. I mean, it's not simply that medical discourse has been, you know, has been hampered by the government going after Twitter and Facebook. You are, you know, you've been at Stanford for a long time. You've gotten a lot of NIH grants. You've gotten a lot of government funding. Have you seen a similar diminution of, of kind of free discussion of alternative hypotheses over the course of your career? I, it does seem like medicine anyways, uh, and, and research in medicine over the course of my career has become more constrained. Mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, I did some work before the pandemic measuring the spread of novel ideas and the support for novel ideas by the NIH. Uh, in fact, the I published National it. Institutes of Health. National Institutes of Health. And that's kind of like, that's the thing. If you get a grant there, then you'll get a lot of other grants. They're kind of like, they give you a, a good housekeeping seal of yeah. approval. In a lot of like med schools, if you're academic med schools, if you get an NIH grant, that, that's like a marker for you, you're going to get tenure. Yeah. Um, a large NIH grant. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, what, what I've seen over the, uh, it, it, in my research is that over the course of, uh, say, the last three decades or four decades, government grants have, be have become much more conservative, right? So if you're... What do I define conservative? So, so here's what I mean. So uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, if you ask how old are the ideas mm -hmm. in a grant proposal, how old are the ideas in a paper, you can actually measure that. You can measure it by... Uh, by asking, like, how, uh, like, when were the words and ideas that, that are in the grant first introduced into the literature? Uh, and what, what I found in my research, again, this is before the pandemic, is that, th that the, uh, the, the grants uh, that the NIH makes tends to support ideas that are older now relative to earlier. So, like, for instance, in the 2010s, you, if you're working on seven- or eight-year-old ideas, that's, that would be most likely to get funded. Whereas in the 1980s, if you're working on two-year-old ideas, it'd be more, more, mm -hmm. more likely to get funded. What, what do you think explains that shift? Is it, yeah, what, I mean, what explains I mean, I, I think part of it is just the leadership of the NIH. Mm -hmm. uh, it was led by uh, Francis Collins in the 2010s. He's, he comes out of this, this human genome project. Mm -hmm. The bias is toward centralized decision-making about what are, should be the priorities of science. Mm -hmm. And... Um, if you have that kind of centralized decision making, you're going to end up with fewer sort of rebels on the outside with new ideas. So it's, if the idea is, is good or is going to 
be proven to be good. If it's centralized, then it's you you can like power up onto the freeway really quickly, right? But it also keeps you from pursuing alternative ideas. Yeah, it's like so that the, a, a good example of a success story of that kind of centralization would be the Manhattan Project, mm-hmm. right? Uh, but a, an example of the failure would be a, a research into Alzheimer's disease, mm-hmm. right? So we, we, essentially, one paradigm, you know, this paradigm of 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 uh, of of, of uh, 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 neurofibrillary tangles mm-hmm. and like uh, uh, amyloid, mm-hmm. that hypothesis, the amyloid hypothesis essentially took over the field mm-hmm. and almost all of the investments the NIH made were based on that hypothesis and led you down a certain line right. and uh, ultimately it has not yet produced the kinds of it, clinical advances that you would want, in part maybe because that maybe the hypothesis is wrong, there may be other hypotheses outside. You, you know, you uh, kind of put the uh, the blame on a single person. This is a big system, but is it is it really that the guy, you know, the captain of the ship is responsible for the centralization? I mean, is it Francis Collins, who's also, you know, came after you by name in emails that came out, you know, shortly after COVID started? No, well, I mean, it's a, it's a, as you say, it's a big policy yeah. decision. And, and part of it is, is, Based on Collins's success with the mm-hmm. Human Genome Project, yeah. right, the centralized, the centralized kind of 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 a, of, a, of, a, of a research direction that resulted in a great advance, yeah. right? Uh, and so, like, we're just trying to repeat what we had before by putting the person who made that success in charge. But it was, you know, obviously a big group of people that not just him. Um, so I think that that kind of uh, of centralization of power actually is is part of the the problem that we had during the pandemic. Yeah. Right. And the censorship feeds into that. You have a relatively small group of science bureaucrats that decide that they know what's true and what they know what's false. And then they they uh, in the in the middle of the pandemic they say or during the pandemic they say, well, mm-hmm. anyone that contradicts us must there automatically be dangerous to the public. Mm-hmm. And and so they're going to they use the power of the government to stop people from hearing that there were other outside voices at all. Mm-hmm. Um, the field of public health, which you you know discuss a lot and analyze a lot, really, you know, seems to have taken it on the chin during COVID because you know both in public uh, kind of discussions of things like that, you would see people one day saying, uh, you know, a bunch of people protesting on the steps of the Mission Capitol that is a super spreader event and those people are insane. Then there would be a popular kind of progressive protest with tens of thousands of people in Brooklyn. And they would say that's not a super spreader event. That's actually good because lobbying for the types of political change they want will save more lives, and it's all about cost benefit and you know, big picture stuff. How does do is, is is it accurate to say that the public health establishment has really lost a lot of trust and confidence from the American people? Absolutely accurate to say that, and I should say even personally, yeah. I've lost almost all confidence in the American public health establishment. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've gained a ton of confidence in the Swedish public health establishment, but that's a, that's a different different. That's because they've succeeded. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think uh, there's a couple of things that are embedded in that that are really important. So first, the uh, the idea that public health has of itself is that it needs essentially unanimity in order to achieve unanimity, perceived unanimity, to in order to achieve its goals. Right. So if some Stanford professor of medicine comes out and says smoking is good for you. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a that's a huge crime in public health settings, right? And it would be a, crime, a moral crime in my view because the tremendous amount of evidence suggests that smoking is really really bad for you, right? I no no one should be mm-hmm. contradicting public health. Certainly not not someone in my position be contradicting public health when the scientific basis for something like that is so strong. Um, so, but they applied that same kind of of what they thought of as deserved unanimity of messaging Mm -hmm. to a situation where the science was not settled in the same way about the science of smoking. And so this gets to the points of where uh, people like Anthony Fauci, who was obviously central to a lot of policy decisions here, you know, saying, well, I lied about the efficacy of, uh, or, you know, about wearing a mask uh, at various points, or the percentage of the population that needed to be infected to achieve herd immunity and things like that. Yeah, I mean that, that that's uh, the, the idea of the noble lie, the idea that somehow public health is, is sitting above everybody else and they can tell you falsehoods in order to manipulate you. I think that certainly contributed to the 
uh, undermining the, 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 the sort of like collapse of public trust in public health. Mm -hmm. The second thing that your example brings up is uh, the ideological bent of most public health practitioners is on the left. I don't think there's anything in principle wrong with that, but I do think that a public health authority that is supposed to care for the entire population, left and right, should not take on explicitly political uh, sort of color to its decision making. What, what's an example of that? Uh, so, for instance, Nature magazine ex explicitly endorsed Biden in for the first time in the history of its magazine. It endorsed a presidential candidate. New England Journal did the same thing, or some, something very similar. Uh, sci I mean, it, basically all of the, the journals that are normally entirely apolitical make explicit political endorsements. Yes. Uh, you gave another example of that, of the, of the, the way that they treated the BLM protests versus the anti-lockdown protests right. in 2020. Um, was, uh, speaking of politics, and you know, two guys who were at the beginning of the pandemic are running for president again, or shuffling for president, um, was is Biden worse than Trump, or are they similar? I mean, because Trump, Trump was the person who called for the, you know, the the lockdown, right? Yeah. No, I think uh, I think that they they both failed during the pandemic. Uh, in in different ways, they both failed. Yeah. Talk a little bit. About uh, what was Trump's primary failure, and what was Biden? I mean, I, I think for for Trump, uh, there's a few things. One, I think that the that the uh, the imposition of the lockdown itself was a failure. Uh, and and I think that the, the the problem was it that it was a failure in that it didn't make sense or it didn't stop the spread or I, I mean I could I, let's say, say say March 2020 right if I were advising President Trump at the time I would have said that the lockdowns are not likely a good idea I would have said it with trepidation not with certainty but I would have said that we don't know about uh, and I would have listed a various set of things that we probably should do scientific studies about before we can have good advice on this. Mm -hmm. Um, I was also would have told him that there were that, that if you lock down, you're going to essentially be locking down for a very long time. There's no such thing as two weeks of lockdown. You create a panic in the population by the act of locking down. So this is you lock down, you're locking down until the end, yeah. whenever it is. Um, that, that, and I would have told him that the harms of lockdown, especially on kids, there's a tremendous literature before the pandemic that suggests that you should never close schools in situations like this because it's going to harm kids without having a tremendous effect on the spread of the disease. I would have told him all those yeah. things. The advice he was getting instead was from Tony Fauci and Deborah Burks. He was getting advice that said, if you don't lock down, if you don't shut down the economy, millions of people are going to die immediately. Within, within a month or two, people, two million people would die in the United States. And so that's that he, the, the, the scientific advisors he, was, he had at the time were giving a very narrow picture of what the scientific debate was about. Mm -hmm. So he, he was very, very poorly informed early in the pandemic. Before we go to Biden, do you think Operation Warp Speed was a success? I think it was a. Uh, uh, I think it was a good idea to do, to do it at the time. Uh, but I, I think that the the the, uh, the success uh, it was a success in one way and a failure in another way. Okay, explain. That. Um, so so a couple of things. So one, um, the the and this this is something I got very wrong early in the pandemic. Uh, I thought it would take a decade to develop a vaccine. Mm -hmm. Right, just because of the history of vaccine yeah. development. Yeah, people um, were talking it was going to be. It could be three to five years before you even really know what's caused. Right. Yeah. So I thought, okay, th there's no good reason to like lock down for for years and years and years because th we don't know we're going to be able to get a vaccine quickly. Now, of course, I was wrong about that, and I was actually quite happy that I was wrong about that. Uh, the development of vaccine so quickly mm -hmm. is a success, absolutely. Um, but it turns out, I think, that the reason why that success happened is tied to the why the virus, why the pandemic may have happened at all, right? So the the, the research agenda that very likely caused the pandemic, mm -hmm. right? The identification uh, of coronaviruses in bat caves in China, that research program, the the whole purpose of it was to develop vaccines quickly and stockpile them so that if those viruses ever led to a human outbreak, we'd have those vi vaccines available very quickly. So I think the jumpstart in the vaccine development is related to that research program that very likely also caused the pandemic. So, I mean, you think it's most likely that this came out of the Wuhan lab? Yeah, I think that's yeah. the most likely explanation. Uh, but that it was not being developed as a chemical weapon or anything like that? I mean, I don't know for yeah. certain, but it seems it doesn't strike me as the kind of thing that's very good for a bioweapon. It's, it strikes yeah. me as a lab accident. Do you, I mean, you, you mentioned uh, that the vaccines don't uh, prevent transmission. 
um, or, you know, or getting the disease, but they do um, minimize the effects, right? Yeah, they reduce, yeah. They reduce the, the likelihood of mortality. So in that sense, I mean, going from, you know, uh, you know, early 2020 to the end of 2020 and having vaccines that were starting to be deployed, that's pretty empowered. That's a that's, success, yeah. right? So uh, the question then is how do you use the vaccines? Mm-hmm. That's where the failure starts to come Okay, uh, explain that. Uh, okay, so, uh, so, okay, so first of all, the, the Oper- Operation Warp Speed is a success, but it's, a, it's, it's also partly a failure because it's part of the, the, the research program that mm-hmm. developed that may have actually caused the pandemic, right? So, um, okay, so now you have a vaccine in December of 2020 that, uh, that very, very clearly in the randomized trial, it stops you from symptomatic infection for two months. Mm-hmm. You don't know for certain whether it stops you from getting the disease or spreading it because that was not a clinical endpoint of the randomized mm-hmm. trials. You also don't know for certain whether it prevents you from dying. That also was not a clinical endpoint of the randomized trials. So you are, put yourself in the shoes of a public health official, right? So how do you use this vaccine? Uh, so I wrote an op-ed in December 2020 with Sunetra Gupta in the Wall Street Journal. What we argued was that if, since it prevents you from getting symptomatic infection, it probably also prevents you from dying. Mm-hmm. We don't know that from certain from the trial. I wish we'd had done the trial differently so we can say that with certainty, but it probably does. In the middle of a pandemic, you have a, a, a group, especially older people, that have a high risk of dying if they get infected, especially for those who have not, not previously been infected. Um, you can use the vaccine on that population right. to reduce the risk of dying. For younger people, it's much less important because the absolute risk of dying is tiny. And so the, the absolute benefit from vaccination is likely to be small, and we don't yet know the side effects, mm-hmm. right? Even though we have a 40,000-person trial, right. it's difficult to know the side yeah, effects until you... When it scales up, anything can happen. So you're saying that all of the vaccine energy really should have gone to older people because they were higher risk. And if there are side effects, I mean, this sounds harsh, but the, you know, if you're 80 years old and you die of a side effect of a disease that would probably kill you anyway... That's a better calculation than making well, a twenty-year-old. This is this happens. This is the, unfortunately the thing that because of the uncertainty about science. This is what happens with medicine. It's always every medicine is there's the harms and potential side effects, and you have to balance, right? So, so what was what was Biden bad on? The, uh, so the, I think the worst thing. The, the, there's several things, but I think the worst thing was the way that he managed the vaccine rollout. Mm-hmm. Right. Instead of accepting the limitations of the scientific data. He and his advisors assumed that the vaccine would stop you from getting and spreading mm-hmm. COVID. And so, like, for instance, the herd immunity threshold numbers that, that Fauci would throw out were premised on the idea that the vaccine would stop you from getting and spreading COVID for a very, very long time. Mm-hmm. In fact, what happened very quickly was that we learned in real practice that the vaccine does not stop you from getting and spreading COVID for very long. Mm-hmm. Uh, within months of the vaccine rollout, you saw huge number of cases, for instance, in Israel which had pretty widespread vaccination. Uh, even before that, in the Seychelles Islands and Gibraltar, they were using different vaccines, but like the, 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 the fact was that these vaccines were not stopping the spread of the disease, mm-hmm. just from a macro point of view, right? And so uh, the, 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 the consequence of getting that wrong and then uh, uh, essentially was to create this distinction in the minds of, of, of uh, and then the mouths of public health people and also of President Biden of, of a clean population and an unclean population, almost a caste system, yeah. where if you're vaccinated, you're clean. If you're unvaccinated, you're unclean. Mm. That you're a pariah, that you're causing the, the extension of the pandemic. And it was just not true. It was not simply inconsistent with what the scientific data was saying. Mm. And then the vaccine, the, the vaccine mandates then came on, not just for, for older people. Older people, you didn't need a mandate. Basically, voluntarily, people took vast numbers of older people took the vaccine without the mandate. Uh, you you mandate it for young people. You premise going to college on the basis of it. You premise being able to work on the basis of it. You premise going to school on the basis of it. You discriminate against people so they can't enter you know public libraries on the basis of it. Even kids. Um, that created a tremendous tension in the minds of people. Like you have on the one hand, you want to believe public health. But you have the clear evidence in front of you. The public health despises you, mm. right? That they want you to be outside of society unless you abide by their by their their their, their edicts. And also, they're not right. Yeah. Like they're saying things that are self evidently wrong. I got the vaccine in April of 2021, and four months later, I got COVID. Right? I'm not the only one. Yeah. I mean, a tremendous number of people experience that. And 
and they're hearing on the other, President Biden say, if, you, if you're unvaccinated, you're a danger to everybody else. That, I think, vastly undermined American trust in public health and also in vaccines more generally than just the COVID vaccine. You, you mentioned, speaking of vaccines, you mentioned, you know, Alex Berenson, who is very anti-vaccine, and RFK Jr., who is not just anti-COVID vaccines, but he's, he's against the polio vaccine and every, basically every vaccine in between. Um, you are not anti-vaccine, are you? No. Yeah. So how does it feel to be, you know, kind of lumped in with anti-vaxxers? <laughs> Well, I, okay, so I, I, should, I should say I really hate that term now. And I think it's a term of derision aimed at undermining a conversation that ought to, be, ought to happen, okay. yeah. right? I think that public health, when it's faced with people who disagree with it, should treat those people respectfully as best it can and, and try to engage, yeah. right? So, so for instance, Alex Berenson is not against other vaccines. I know him personally, yeah. you know him well. So he's it, only against the COVID vaccine. Well, he was, I mean, and I wouldn't even say he's against the COVID vaccine. He was just ca- calling out very early right earlier than most people, that the COVID vaccine wasn't stopping you from getting and spreading COVID. He turned out to be exactly right on right. that fact. Okay. Right? Uh, and so, and yet he was treated, he was named specifically by Andy Slavitt, a, a presidential advisor, as a, a subject of being censored. On, and he actually won a couple of court battles against uh, the yeah, he's, uh, Biden he got, administration. Or, or so, I mean, and, and, so. and it was tremendously, it was a tremendous mistake because right. he, he was right on the, on that issue. And in any case, even if he's wrong, you would argue that he should be able to be in error publicly where people would discuss and... Exactly. And he's, what, he's, about, he's, what about somebody like RFK Jr., though? He, you know, who I have literally engaged, uh, you know, in conversation, he is against every vaccine that has been brought out. Okay, so I, I don't, I have to say, I have to confess, I didn't, I didn't tr- track his positions yeah. very closely on, on the vaccines. I know he's like associated with Children's Health Defense. Um, from what I've, I have not also interacted with him personally. Yeah. I have interacted with his, with his vice presidential candidate. Um, uh, from what I can tell, there, there, it's it's not so much that he's like directly against all these all the vaccines. It, that, it's that he is pointing to holes in the databases that we have about so the side effects of some of these vaccines, and he's calling for more study on them, which is fair enough, right? I mean, like there there are. Science is a, science requires right. question, people to question it, um, and I think most of the controversy is that is public health saying, "Look, no one should question us," right? R- rather than saying he's auto- automatically against all the vaccines. I don't I don't know for a fact yeah. that he is, and I don't know. I've not I've not heard him say that. Well, directly. he I mean he you know really made a name in terms of vaccines with a story that was subsequently retracted by Rolling Stone based on a retracted Lancet study about the um, effects of MMR vaccines causing autism, autism and yeah. things like that. I mean, that. I don't think the MMR va- vaccine is likely, the likely cause of autism yeah. on the basis of this large Dutch study. Um, but I do think that there is a, there's a real thing that he's tapping into, which right. is that there is a very large increase in autism mm-hmm. diagnoses in, this, in right. this country. A huge number of kids are involved. A lot of parents are very worried about their kids. And we don't know why. So, yeah, get to, get to this question of, you know, is there... Do you at some point say, uh, you know, okay, well, like science, nothing is ever settled, but does that mean you always have to be, and now let's talk to the senator with the tinfoil hat on, who is advancing an argument that seems to be completely nuts. Um, And maybe it's that you allow them to speak, you don't necessarily have to engage them, but you certainly don't banish them from public discourse. Yeah, I mean, I I think um, the model is, if you have, uh, if you are a trustworthy public health agency, mm-hmm. and you are treating people respectfully, even people you think are yep. wrong, you're going to influence a vastly larger number of people than if you say these people are are pariahs that belong outside the bounds of normal society. I think that uh, because sometimes every once in a while they're right. It's not like public health is infallible. Obviously not. Right. right. And yeah. so so you have to then say, I want to treat ideas that I disagree with respectfully right. because I might be wrong. Mm-hmm. That's going to end up putting you in a position first of telling the, the public the truth more, right? right? Conveying the uncertainty. That, that is really right. a big value for you, right? And all of this is transparency, especially if you are an authority, whether it's public health or anything else that you're laying your cards on the table and saying, this is my this is my thought process, this is the data that I'm using. And I mean, this goes back to the Enlightenment. Here it is, you check it out and tell me where I've, you know, I've made mistakes. Exactly, I mean, that's how science 
science actually works, right? Yeah. Science works by people Ideally, threatening right. each other, right? Yeah. So like, I mean, I'm wrong all the time. In fact, if as a scientist, I'm not wrong, I'm not being bold enough as right. a scientist. So what what is the biggest thing that you got wrong about COVID? I, I mean, I think that, that the, 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 I already mentioned the development of the, or I thought the vaccine was gonna take a decade to develop. Did, I, I, didn't you also, you expected a lower uh, infection fatality rate earlier. I think I got that right. Oh yeah, uh, okay. yeah. So like, I did a I did a a study in the uh, um, uh, in April of 2020, mm-hmm. and uh, measuring how many people had already had had COVID based on antibodies in the population in Santa Clara County, California, and LA County, California, a week after that. And what we found was that there were like 40 cases per per, per mm-hmm. uh, like for every case that had been identified by public health, there were 40 people walking around who had already had COVID and recovered. Uh, same thing in LA County. That implied a infection fatality rate of 0.2% mm-hmm. uh, in California. Uh, it replied that the disease has already spread to three or four percent of the population by April, early April 2020, and that uh, and that the third the third thing is that that it's this is not the kind of disease you stop it at, at either you stop it at zero or it's going to go to 100. You don't ever stop and there's nothing you don't have technology to stop it in between. So it, there's still a long pandemic. Mm-hmm. We had so all of those results were implied by our study. Um, it was tremendously controversial because people thought that 0.2% was too low of infection fatality rate. And that's like in the flu range, right? Or well, the flu is less than that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe 0.1%. Okay. I mean, no one yeah. really knows for certain exactly right. what the flu is. But I, I think it's le- COVID was on average more deadly than the flu for the world, just obviously, right? Um, but so uh, the um, there were a tremendous, there were many, many other studies that came out after that, serum prevalence studies done by independent teams, some of which found lower infection fatality rates and others which found higher infection fatality rates. Ours turned out to be pretty close to the middle of the pack of these studies. Um, The ones that found lower infection fatality rate tended to be in places with fewer elderly people in it, like in Africa, for instance. Mm -hmm. Almost zero infection fatality rate because only 3% of the population is over the age of 65, and this disease really impacts older people. Uh, Whereas in New York City, it was like higher. It was like 0.8% or 0.9%. So you had this... Uh, the idea that the infection fatality rate is a single number is a, is false, right? It, sh- it is a it is it depends on the nature of the population that the disease is infecting, and we found a number that was at pretty close to the middle of the range of uh, estimates found by the infection fatality rate. What um, what effect did it have on your broader kind of political or ideological or just philosophical worldview when you were on the you know on the the blunt end of this kind of um, you know, uh, uh, just being kind of put in an internal exile or, you know, taken off of Twitter, being attacked all the time and things like that. Do, you know, did that affect how you think about things beyond medicine? I, I mean, I, um, I, come, I have a PhD in economics and I come from a, I mean, if, if you can say like, like a political and it's like s- somewhat market liking kind of, kind, of, kind of direction, but also recognizing the need for, for you know, sort of markets can have excesses and you have to like be careful about how to... I how don't to, know what you're saying, but I'll nod and say... Okay. Yeah. No, I don't know. I, I don't know what I'm saying either. Market What's failure, the that's a contradiction. <laughs> in dark. No, okay. So, I, was, I mean, you were predisposed towards, you know, markets are pretty effective at things like that. You're a doctor. You under... So yeah, what, but at the same time... Like, being canceled. What, yeah, and, and so like all of a sudden I'm being characterized as this like far right libertarian. Yeah. But I'm, I'm espousing a policy embraced by a... Uh, a, 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 a like a, effectively a socialist s- Swedish public health mm-hmm. go- you know government yeah. right uh, and so and I and and I'm uh, in the UK uh, I'm opposed to this right wing uh, Boris Johnson Tory kind of kind of uh, uh, thing. I'm I'm criticizing a public the public health response by President Trump yeah. uh, but at the same time I'm advising uh, Governor Ron DeSantis in Florida. Right, uh, you know, and, and quite opposed to the Californian lockdown focus strategy for the left wing governor. I have no idea what my politics are after this. Uh, my closest allies are uh, Sunetra Gupta, who's a Labour voter mm-hmm. uh, in the UK, yeah, yeah, at University of Oxford, at the University of Oxford, right, and and then uh, Martin Kulldorff, who I have no idea what his politics are, and I, he's like a brother to me. Like I don't. Uh, what I what I one of the things I re- I learned is that like, public health is not really it, it fundamentally is not. Uh, ought not to have this sort of partisan po- political mm-hmm. flavor to it, 
right? When you, when you add that in, it really undermines public health. It's not that public health can't, is not part of politics. Obviously, it has a political angle, uh, but, it, but it's, a, it's a completely different game than politics. Politics, you get 50 plus one, you've won. Public health, you get 50 plus one, you've failed. Right. You need 95%. In that sense, I guess I'm a failure in public health. Like I not, didn't get 90%. I mean, hopefully someday I'll get the 95% plus Do one you, that I want. Uh, you know, just as a final question, you know, is, is the pandemic, you know, is the COVID pandemic in the rearview mirror? And if so, you know, when something like it comes along again, are we going to learn from our experience? And if so, what's the main lesson? Or are we going to be like, screw it, well, let's, let's do this again? So the depressing answer is that I don't think that we've learned much from it. Uh, the, the, there have been very few official public inquiries that have asked really the right questions about what we did wrong. Like the, the, the one, like for instance, the UK public inquiry seems, the premise seems to be, why didn't we lock down early enough or hard enough? Why weren't we more like China? Locking down earlier, I don't believe would have done anything because I think the disease was here in 2019, like December, no, November 2019. Um, and so, we, and we didn't know about it. So I don't think, I think it had already been seeded all around the world even before. So I think that we, that we have not learned the right lessons from the pandemic. Um, the, the, the right lessons, I think, include things like hu- the humility of public health in the face of uncertainty, uh, f- flexibility of thinking, uh, the involvement of a wide array of scientific voices uh, to advise politicians. Uh, I think those in the early days of a pandemic would have been tremendously, actually all through the pandemic would have been a tremendously, would have led to tremendously better outcomes. Mm-hmm. Do you, uh, you know, as a uh, naturalized citizen uh, of America, do you think that Americans are a- able to make the health choices for themselves fundamentally? Because part of the noble lie, and there's a right-wing version of this and a left-wing version, which is like, come on, you people out there, you just, you, you can't handle the truth. Um, do you think that's fundamentally wrong? Yeah, I think that's fundamentally wrong. I think that uh, health is a human right in the sense of uh, I should fundamentally be able to decide just for myself what decisions, what what things I do with my body. Um, and I think uh, uh, that uh, that if I if I believe that, I believe in patient autonomy, informed consent. I think those are fundamental ethical principles that that I think are that serve medicine well. Uh, because if you have a medicine that is paternalistic, that says, look, I know what's good for you, Nick. I, I'm going to stop you from wearing that leather jacket, which is horrible. I, 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 no, it's not actually. I, I really like it. Um, I get that all the time. I get that all the time. How about a lot of blacklists for this? I, 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 so the, pro- the problem with that is, like, why would you trust me? Right? Why would you believe me? Right? Uh, the, you, because you, you're the great, you're a doctor, you have a lot of degrees and you have expertise <laughs> and knowledge. How has that worked out? I mean, yeah. and if I'm, if I'm using it to change who you are, like things that you care about, uh, you, trade-offs you make, then um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing you an injustice. I mean, I can tell you that smoking is bad for you, that it causes lung cancer, and then you still go smoke a cigar because you're hanging out with your friends and you enjoy it and it makes, makes your life better for that, that moment. Who am I to tell you not to do it, right? I, I, what, my job is to tell you that, that smoking, smoking has these health consequences. To reflect the medical literature as best I can, as honestly as I can, and help you make the best choices for yourself. We're going to leave it there. Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, thanks for talking to me. Thank you.